For centuries, the growing settlement of Malcolm Regis sat on a shingly peninsula, almost surrounded by water. To the east was the open sea, to the south was the historic harbour, and to the west was a vast area of tidal water known as the backwater, stretching right up to Radipole village. Apart from a narrow neck of land on the north side, the only dry access to Melcombe was the town bridge, initially a timber structure first erected in 1597. The lack of access to the west was not a major issue, as across the backwater was still mostly farmland. However, by the 1850s, the growing population of Malcolm Regis brought the desperate need for a new cemetery. But with no space for this within the town, a new cemetery was laid out in the fields on the other side of the backwater. The problem was that the inhabitants had a long and tortuous trek to visit it. There was no path or road along the west side of the backwater. This prompted a group of worthies to promote a scheme for a bridge to cross the narrowest part of the backwater. Important schemes like this required parliamentary approval, so the Backwater Bridge and Road Bill 1857 was sought to authorise the work. Not everyone was happy. There were many vested interests, including one councillor whose wife had £3,000 shares in the existing town bridge, the toll's income from which he feared would be worthless once a new bridge was opened. Even the town council initially objected to the bill, fearing the bridge would hinder development upstream. Everyone would have to pay tolls to the trustees to use the new bridge, except for funerals and for access to any future docks. The bill stipulated that a swivel or opening bridge with a span of at least 50 feet must be included to ensure vessels could navigate to the upper reaches at all times and there must be a minimum clearance of six feet from water to deck at all states of the tide. Everything had to be approved by the Admiralty as it was tidal waters. A civil engineer, Piers Arthur, was commissioned to produce the detailed design for the bridge. With his surveyors in 1856, he made a detailed plan of the entire Malcolm Regis area of Weymouth. Prominently marked on his map was his proposed bridge. Piers Arthur worked closely with Philip Dodson, a prolific and wealthy builder, developer and timber merchant who was borough mayor three times in the 1850s. Piers Arthur designed the new backwater bridge and Dodson was the builder. Incidentally, Dodson had acquired a large plot of vacant land at the Narrows towards the north end of the seafront, where, in 1855-57, to 57, he built a magnificent hotel, which Piers Arthur had designed, naming it after his friend William Burden, proprietor of the gasworks. The Burden Hotel was much later renamed the Hotel Prince Regent. Philip Dodson's other achievements were of a mind-blowing scale. With his army of skilled tradesmen and workers, he constructed a pioneering long and wide brick tunnel for a gas pipe under the bed of the backwater. His firm constructed the Great Binkham Tunnel at Ridgeway on the Dorchester to Weymouth railway line, the original Clifftop convict prison at Portland, and his crowning glory was the St John's Church whose tall spire has dominated the Weymouth skyline since 1854. Against all that, the new timber bridge must have been seen as a doddle, but it was to prove his downfall. Dodson started the construction of the bridge in July 1859 and progress was rapid. Heavy timber piles were driven into the riverbed and a pile-driving machine was floated in position to drive supports for the central gate piers. Stone piers were erected at each end of the 40-foot-wide roadway. 
the new link to the west side offered immense prospects. It connected Little George Street, now Western Road, via a new road, now Abbotsbury Road, through the fields to the Turnpike Road to Chickraw. Reports said Weymouth will have the chance of extending itself in the shape of suburban villas, arising like fairy palaces under the magic manipulations of the Master Mason. Whether the vast housing developments that followed across the fields of Westham met that vision is not clear, but there aren't many fairy palaces in evidence. The 250 yards long timber bridge was nearly complete by May 1860 when one of the supports nearly collapsed and had to be propped up with blocks. That did not augur well for the bridge, which became dogged by increasing issues. The problems must have weighed heavily on the builder, Philip Dodson, for in July 1860 he killed himself by taking cyanide. As the inquest said, while under the influence of temporary insanity. His cortege took the long way around to the cemetery, pointedly avoiding passing over the bridge he had just built. In fact, until additional supports were installed, the structure was not strong enough to support the weight of carriages, so only pedestrians could use it. Sadly, Dodson's simple gravestone in the Malcolm Cemetery tells nothing of his great achievements. Barges and boats found navigating past the bridge a challenge, tidal currents causing them to crash into the piles. Soon after, the much more substantial timber viaduct for the Portland Railway was constructed just upstream. The new Western Bridge did nothing to control the flow of water, which was becoming increasingly contaminated with the town's smelly sewage which was discharged from both sides of the backwater. A solution was desperately needed, so in 1871 the famous John Coode, engineer of the great Portland breakwaters, was commissioned to produce a scheme to deal with it. Detailed sections and borings were taken. In addition to new sewers and outfalls, Coode recommended that a masonry dam or weir be constructed just below the bridge to ensure that upstream water covered the stinking mud banks at all times. The dam was to have an 18 foot opening in the centre to permit the passage of barges and boats. A gate was included to retain the water at the required level. Coode's dam had a core of clay, sheet piling, surmounted with shaped Portland roach stone paving. Two substantial masonry piers flanked the central gap and a timber gangway from the Malcolm side gave access to the single leaf tide gate. The dam was constructed by contractor Joseph Phillips in 1872, but within two years two large holes appeared in the bed above and below the dam and further urgent repairs were carried out in 1884. Despite modifications, the dam did not cure all the problems. The stink coming from the backwater is very objectionable, arising from the exposure of the sewage to the sun and heat on the dry mud banks, decaying seaweed and the constant irritation of the sewage by the rush of water over the dam. The banks were overrun by rats, which in July 1886 reportedly killed 50 young cygnets. Residents had to live with the stench until well into the 20th century. Coode's dam remained almost intact until being demolished for the new Inner Harbour Marina in 1995. The halfpenny tolls were abolished when the bridge was declared a county bridge in 1879, but the county still argued that the borough should pay to repair it. The bridge was now in such a dangerous state that users' lives were in peril. The Borough Surveyor declared, May 1880, that it was unsafe even for existing traffic. 
Notices were posted at each end stating unsafe bridge, but these were ignored. The road bridge needed frequent repairs and modifications, while the timbers inevitably continued to rot. In 1882 the bridge had to be closed for major repairs. Piles and decking were replaced, and the opening section was replaced by a fixed deck, finally enabling full use by carts and light carriages. The new residents of sprawling western suburb now petitioned for a proper footpath along the bridge, which was eventually created in 1891. That was a disaster, as two years later a further petition complained of the danger of children falling through the open gaps in the recently constructed footway. Despite everything, the bridge link remained a busy lifeline. A count on one day in 1884 showed the bridge was crossed by 570 vehicles, 140 horses, 125 cattle and 537 pedestrians, all struggling to pass over the failing deck. On, over the rickety bridge, into the new century and in 1914 Dorset passed responsibility back to the Borough Council. A replacement bridge of stone was planned, but of course everything stopped for the Great War. Listen to the late architectural historian Eric Ricketts recalling his earliest memory as a toddler in the middle of the war. I said like six years ago, seven years ago, really you had enough. You see, I, when I was three years old, my mother and my father was away on other business in the North Sea, and my mother took me across the first Western Bridge, a rickety, if that's the right word, timber construction, and the, uh, the footway had planks of wood about a couple of inches apart almost. It was condemned, of course, but the war being on, it survived, and she took me across, and I would insist on bending down on my knees and looking through these gaps at the marvellous tide flowing up to, up to the, uh, what is now the bird sanctuary, and then flowing out again, and the waves impressed me, and so I was intrigued with the backwater and this inland water where one could get a rowing boat and row up to Radipole Church. Now, Radip the final word on this infamous first Western Bridge must go to a girl of Weymouth Secondary School, later the Grammar School, which had been built on the Western side in 1913. In 1919, she wrote this little piece, which she called Now Western Bridge. Now Western Bridge is in a state of ruin and one day, with all its passengers, will collapse and fall into the backwater. Now the town councillors converse in their chamber of repairs. Shall the bridge be repaired or not? What will the cost be? Now the ratepayers dread to see the results of the last meeting. They need not worry. It is not being carried out for twenty years and is not likely to be for another twenty. Now the rain comes beating into the faces of the poor pedestrians and all those who cannot ride in closed vehicles. Now the wind rushes up the skirts of the poor schoolgirls who tramp across the rickety bridge four times a day. Now one of the Corinthians studies her Latin when splash, down fall her homework books into the water. She wonders what will happen when she goes to see the powers that be and her books have to be replaced. Now the keeper goes on his daily round to feed the swans, which have now returned to their island home. Now the Portland Express crawls past the end of the bridge, making the framework shake, while the schoolgirl shakes in her shoes because the gates are shut and it's five minutes to nine. Now the pupils of Western Secondary School cross the bridge, two abreast according to Rule 1. 
Now the bridge is so shaky, it can only support two tons. Now a motor lorry comes along, load three tons. What is it to do? What? No police about? That's good. Chance it, yes. Away it spins over the bridge, making it rattle. This will happen once too often, sad to say I. Now the weary Westerners return from town and get blown away, owing to the lack of corrugated iron at the sides. Now the longing eyes of W.S.S. pupil can scan the sheet of water, which she hopes will be filled in for a hockey pitch. One day, Echo says, one day. That schoolgirl did not have to wait long. The end of the old bridge was nigh, and in that same year, 1919, the council adopted a scheme to build a new, solid embankment bridge engineered to the latest revolutionary principles. The fascinating story of the new Western Bridge and Embankment Dam is told in Part 2.